So in just about every week of this series that we're currently in, we've looked at um, one of two verses just about every Sunday. And um, the verse that I'm referencing right now is uh, Galatians chapter 5 and verse 1, where Paul writes and says, it's for freedom that Christ has set us free. Stand firm, therefore, and do not submit again to a yoke of slavery. And I'm so thankful for the fact that Jesus Christ makes it possible for us to not only experience freedom eternally in heaven one day, which is amazing, but that Jesus also gives us the ability, the opportunity to walk in freedom right now in our, in our everyday lives. But I hope that you understand that as long as we are fixated on the wrong thoughts and as long as we're fixated on the wrong feelings, as long as we are making the wrong choices, we're never going to be able to live in the freedom that Jesus came and died for so that we could be free. So today, what I want to do is, I, I want to focus on this thought, this concept. It's time to take back our mind. It, it, it's time to take back our mind. No more believe in the lies of the enemy. No more believe in the lies that we've convinced ourselves about. No more believe in the lies of other people. It's time to take back control of our minds. You see, this, this battle that we're in, whatever battle you're currently fighting, the battles we fight don't just take place out here, although they do. The battles we fight don't just take place here, although they do take place there. A lot of times, the battles we fight take place right here. They, they take place in our minds. They take place in our thought process. We're going to start today in Philippians chapter 4, and we've looked at some, some verses in Philippians chapter 4 already in this series, and, and so we're going to kind of, you know, go back over those verses, but then we're going to take it a step further um, today. So as always, and I think you're used to this by now, just kind of be prepared for me to stop along the way as I'm reading these verses and make some comments where you're listening, you're like, my Bible doesn't say that. No, that's just me commenting about verses. So Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 4, Paul writes this, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Now, we talked a couple weeks ago about how even though Paul is writing this letter from prison to this church in Philippi, he is trying to encourage them. One thing he's understood, and he's trying to encourage everyone else, is that whatever battle you are fighting, every battle should start with praise. You got to start that fight. You got to start that battle with praise. You don't wait until you're on the other side before you praise, but you praise at the beginning, or excuse me, at the beginning of every battle that you fight. Verse six, do not be anxious about anything, okay? If I'm not supposed to be, then what am I supposed to do with it? But in everything, by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your request be made known to God. So what's Paul telling us to do with our, with our anxiousness, with our struggles, with our fights? He's, he's telling us to release them, to, to make them known, to, to tell people, to don't keep it inside, don't keep it within, don't fight it all by yourself, but he's saying to go ahead and release those struggles. And then what's the result? Verse seven, and the peace of God which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. Now, I don't know what you do in your physical Bible. I don't know if you circle. I don't know if you underline. I don't know if you highlight. But do something with those two words, hearts and minds. So in order to help us 
with what we put into our hearts, and in order to help us with what we put into our minds, Paul presses on a little further in verse 8 by saying this, finally, brothers, whatever's true, whatever's honorable, whatever's just, whatever's pure, whatever's lovely, whatever's commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. So what's he saying? If we are going to constantly be thinking about and on the wrong things, then obviously that's going to give way to more anxiousness, to more fear, to more doubts. But when you and I are giving thought to the right thing, to the biblical thing, to the godly thing, to the things that are true, well, obviously that's going to help us be victorious in the battle that takes place in our minds. So this is where we stopped a couple weeks ago with Philippians chapter 4 in verse 8. But I want to move on today a little further, beginning in verse 9. And there's going to be a word that you see a couple times throughout these next couple of, of verses that are of great, that's of great importance in, in what we're talking about today. He says in verse 9, What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things. And what's the result? What, what, what happens if we do the things that Paul is telling us to do? And the God of peace will be with you. I rejoice in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have, here's the word again, learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have, one more time, learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance, and need. And then the, the ever familiar verse, verse 13, I can do all things through him, through Christ, who strengthens me. So Paul says, the things that I'm telling you to do, the way I'm telling you to think, hey, guess what? I've learned to do that. It, it wasn't always true in my life. It wasn't always that way. I didn't always get it right. I didn't always think about the right thing. Paul says, the things I'm telling you to do right now in order to help your life so you can have the peace of God in your life, it is a learned process. It is something that you and I can and should learn. Is it spiritual? Absolutely. Is it in and through the power of the Holy Spirit, 100%. But it's learned. Please continue to remind yourself that we're talking about progress, not perfection. We're talking about progress. Where we continue to get better in the areas that we need to get better in. We continue to learn what it is that we need to learn. Why is it so important for us to learn what we need to learn? So that we can do what we need to do. But we can't do what we need to do without learning what we need to learn. And, and this is what Paul is telling us in these verses. And let me let you know a little secret that I hope is not a secret. I hope you already know this. We should never stop learning. You never get to the point this side of heaven where you're like, oh, tapped out, I'm done, I'm full. I, I don't need to learn anything else because you know what happens when you stop learning? You stop growing. You, you, you always have to be willing to learn. So let's learn some things this morning, okay? And, and I want you to turn over in your Bibles to Acts chapter 27, if you would, please. And in Acts chapter 27, what we're going to see is we're going to see Paul involved in a situation where Paul is going to be living out the things that he's learned the things that he's gotten better at, that the things that he continues to grow in those areas in his life. And you think about Paul, one of the greatest things about Paul is that he not only learned the importance that the battle's in the mind, but he also learned the importance to not let his circumstances impact his outlook. 
Because every time we're focused on our circumstances, I guarantee we're not thinking the thoughts that God wants us to think. We're not encouraged. We're, we're, we're not motivated if we're thinking or if we're thinking about the circumstances in our life. So let me give you a little background here. Paul is on his way to Rome. Paul is, is getting near the end of his life. And Paul finds himself in yet again another stress-filled situation. Now, I personally know what ministry has done to me over the past 27 years and how it has changed the way that I look and the way that I feel and the color of my hair where I still do have hair. So I can just imagine Everything that Paul's been through in his life, I can just imagine of, of how old Paul must have looked at this time in his life. Now, granted, he most likely didn't also have an addiction to Dunkin' Donuts iced coffees, so he had that going for him in his life, but I guarantee life was taking a toll on him, and I guarantee he was tired, and I guarantee he was weary. So Paul is once again a prisoner but this time, he's not in a prison cell praising and praying. We find Paul on a ship as a prisoner. And so let's pick up the story in Acts chapter 27 and verse 9. Since much time had passed and the voyage was now dangerous because even the fast was already over. The fast signifies the day of atonement. So the Day of Atonement is going to take place sometime in the fall. So basically, this is storm season. It's like, you know what? Hey, let's go ahead and let's sign up to take a cruise to the Caribbean in the fall in the middle of hurricane season. This is what's taking place here in our story. So Paul advised them, verse 10, saying, Sirs, I perceive that the voyage will be with injury and much loss not only of the cargo and the ship, but also of our lives. Now, don't you agree with me when I, I kind of just kind of throw in here that the crew right now is probably thinking, nobody asked you, man. Nobody asked you your opinion, your thought. Verse 11, but the centurion paid more attention to the pilot and to the owner of the ship than to what Paul said. So, so Paul is, is speaking a warning to everybody on the ship saying, hey guys, I, I've been through this before, I've been down this road before, and I just want to let you guys know that I don't have a good feeling about this. Like, I, I've got a bad feeling that things are going to turn out really bad, and I don't think I'm being influenced by like bad Mexican from the night before or anything like that. I mean, I don't think this is a good idea. But they ignore him. And he's like, we're not just talking about us losing things. We could very well lose lives here. But they ignore him. They decide to listen to the pilot over the preacher. And let me add this. I don't blame them, right? You can't blame them here. If we're all on a boat and I start talking about what I think you should do, don't listen to me because I don't know. Thank you, Steph, all right, for that reinforcement. Now, let me pause right here and ask you to write this down, if you would, please, if you're taking notes. Your thoughts are steering the ship of your life. Your thoughts are steering the ship of your life. Pastor and author and the original Craig, who was asked to do the wedding of my daughter Ricky and Shane before, you know, obviously didn't work out, Craig Rochelle, says this, your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Your life is always moving in the direction of your strongest thoughts. Isn't he describing anxiety? <laughs> Isn't that what anxiety is? A part of it at least? thinking about the same thing over and over and over and over again. Think about it. If your mind is filled with the lies of the enemy, it's going to impact the direction of your life. If your mind is filled with the truth of the word of God, 
it's going to impact the direction of your life. So what are we allowing to influence us in our thought process, which is always going to impact and influence the direction of our life? Paul, Paul's like, guys, hey, hey, this is not my first rodeo, all right? Been through this before. Y'all need to listen to me. But they didn't listen. Verse 13. But when the south wind blew gently, supposing that they had obtained their purpose, they weighed anchor and sailed along Crete close to the shore. But soon a tempestuous, been practicing that word all week, wind called the northeaster or nor'easter today struck down from the land. And when the ship was caught and could not face the wind, we gave way to it and we were driven along. Now, now, are you paying attention to what's taking place right now? Verse 15 is basically saying that they got caught up in, in with some wind and, and they stopped trying to pilot the ship. They basically just said, we give up. Wherever the wind takes us is where we're gonna go. When we're at the mercy, we're at the control of the wind. I give up. And it got me thinking and reminding me about something that happened years ago. Years ago, myself and Natalie, my sister-in-law, we were, going, we were going skiing up to Mount Brighton. And my first question was, we ski on garbage dumps around here? But anyway, that's besides the point. And we were going up to Mount Brighton, and this is how long ago this was. Our now 25-year-old was only a couple months old, so Steph didn't go with us. Steph couldn't go with us. So we're driving north on 23 in my mother-in-law's Ford Probe, important <clears throat> part of the story, and, and we come around 23. When you get north of Ann Arbor and it kind of curves a little bit, we come around the curve and I lose control of the vehicle. And we are just spinning and we are doing circles and, and it felt like we were in the matrix and like everything was like slow motion and everything. Like I was having a conversation with Natalie. I'm like, what do I do? What do I do? She's like, I'm 12. I don't know what to do. And we're just spinning, and it finally got to the point where it felt like I was just like, well, let's see how this ends up. <laughs> and it ended up with me, the son-in-law, crashing my mother-in-law's Ford Probe into a guardrail, and we were now facing southbound on the northbound side of the road. And you should have seen the police officer's face when he came up to the window, and he asked me what happened, and I told him that I crashed my mother-in-law's car. He felt horrible for me at that moment. And I'm so thankful that my mother-in-law allowed me to stay in the family today. <laughs> but when it comes to the battle of our minds, that's exactly what some people do. When it comes to battling and controlling our minds, too many times people say, well, whatever. Whatever happens, happens. Wherever my mind ends up, my mind ends up. I'm not going to fight anymore. I'm not going to go through this anymore. You know what? Whatever happens, happens. And we think that we can just watch whatever we want, and we can listen to whatever we want, and we can talk and think however we want, and we really think, you know what? It's not that big a deal. Whatever happens, happens. Folks, when we let our minds go wherever our minds want to go, most of the time, they end up in a bad place. Most of the time, it ends up in some type of destruction when we don't continue to battle and fight for control of our minds. L listen to these statistics, which I thought were not only true, but alarming. Research says that 70% of what we think about is negative, and 90% of what we think about is recycled. Now, I read it on the internet, so it has to be true, right? And we laugh, but you know what the, the sad part is? I bet it's pretty close to that. I, I bet those statistics are correct. So that's saying that we not only spend most of our time thinking about negative things, but we spend most of our time thinking about the same negative thing over and over and over and over and over again. And doesn't that cause us to feel the way that we feel? Doesn't that cause us to be anxious? 
because it's the same negative thing over and over and over again? I would argue maybe not every time and maybe not every situation and every person, but I would argue that with most people, it's usually the same one or two or three things that cause us to think and feel the way that we do. It's the same thing over and over and over again. It's the same what ifs over and over again. It's the same questions over and over again. It's the same lies over and over again. It's the same people over and over again that cause us anxiety. Folks, if we want to take back control of our lives, it starts here. It starts here. It starts in our minds. Do you know where an uncontrolled mind leads? Look at verse 20 of Acts chapter 27. Here's where an uncontrolled mind leads. When neither sun nor stars appeared for many days, and no small tempest lay on us, all hope of our being saved was at last abandoned. Do you want to know where an uncontrolled mind leads? I give up. I quit. All hope is gone. There's not a chance of things ever getting better. And I would argue that there are some of you, maybe many of you, who you either have been or you are real, real close to calling it quits and giving up hope. Ah, I can't do it anymore. I can't fight anymore. Mainly because we've convinced ourselves that the lies of the enemy for some reason are true, but the truth from, words God, from God's word is not. Well, I'm here to tell you today, and we've talked about it in the series. We said it's going to be a fight. We said you got to stand firm. We said you got to keep standing. No one ever said it's going to be easy. But don't you dare give up hope. You can't give up hope. Because you give up hope, there's no reason to continue to fight. I want to give you something that's very basic yet very practical. Watch what Paul says in verse 21. Since they had been without food for a long time, Paul stood up among them and said, men, you should have listened to me and not have set sail from Crete and incurred this injury and loss. Now, this is not the part that I'm, that I'm the practical part that I'm trying to say to you, but, but Paul does what so many of us really enjoy doing. Told you so, right? I mean, Men, grown men are crying and thinking they're going to lose their life and, and things are not looking good. And Paul's like, you know what, guys? I don't want to be that guy, but I'm going to be that guy. I told you so. Y'all should have listened to me. That's not the part I want us to focus in on, okay? But this next part is, verse 22, yet now I urge you to take heart. Look at the person next to you and say, take heart. Okay, now when you say that because it's a word of encouragement, actually show some type of encouragement when you say it. Look at somebody and say, take heart. Oh my goodness, man. Take heart. Oh, thou, all right, yeah, woo I'm ready. No, take heart. You're like, ah, am I allowed to yell in church? I just gave you permission to. Thank you. Take heart. For there will be no loss of life among you, but only of the ship. For this very night there stood before me an angel of the God to whom I belong and whom I worship. Now don't miss that. Please don't miss that. Here's Paul, a prisoner, in the middle of a storm, not being listened to. And here's the practical thing that I want to point out to you. Even in the middle of the situation, Paul knew who he was and whose he was. He knew who his heavenly father was. He knew who his God was. And he knew how faithful his God had been. And so he could tell someone else to take heart. Because I, I know things are tough. How would life be different 
If in your life, when life was unfair and life was a battle and life was a fight and and it was really hard, how would life be different when even in those moments you reminded yourself of who you are and whose you are? In that moment, how would your life be different? Who would you be believing in your head? Instead of believing the lies of the enemy, you reminded yourself who you are in Christ and whose you are. I mean, think about it. Paul is a prisoner on a ship, yet Paul is the, also the most free man on the ship because he knew who he was and who he belonged to. And this is so important for us to realize and remember. Because you know what's right around the corner for most of us at one time or another? A bad situation. Tough circumstances. The difficulties of life. And if you can remind yourself now who you are and whose you are, I think we all are going to be, we'll have a better chance of continuing to fight. Now, I'm not, I'm not minimizing what anyone in this room has ever been through, is currently going through, or will ever go through. I will never minimize that, but can I just encourage you to take heart and remember who you are and whose you are. Let let, let that truth ring in your head over and over and over again. Remember who you are and whose you are. Verse 24, and this angel, and he said, do not be afraid, Paul, you must stand before Caesar. And behold, God has granted you all those who sail with you. So take heart, men, for I have faith in God, that it will be exactly as I have been told, but we must run aground on some island. Now, you may think, well, this is just old hat for Paul, right? Because, I mean, what, the Bible talks about him going through like three shipwrecks in his life. So, so it's no big deal. I mean, Paul, Paul's like, hey, guys, the ship's going down, but hey, don't worry about it. We'll be all right. Yeah, I've been through this before. You know, no big deal. We got this. Everybody else is running around screaming. And he's like, well, this is just another Tuesday for me. You know, no big deal. You know, God's got this. We're going to be okay. Because God was faithful. Even though Paul was a prisoner, he, he knew that God had a purpose. Even though Paul was a prisoner, he knew God had a plan. In verse 25, he said, Take heart, men, for I have faith in God. I believe in God. So let me ask you, is our faith in a faithful God going to be stronger in our life in the middle of life's difficulties than our unbelief, than our fear, than our doubts? You know what the reality of life is? Ships sink and loss happens. But God is still God and God is still good. And that has to be enough to pull you through. That that has to be enough to keep going, to keep moving in the right direction. I want to close as quickly as I can this morning by giving you some practical steps that that we all must take in in this battle within. So there's three things there. Um, Once again, if you're taking notes, here's the first thing. What is the thing that causes you to be anxious? Have you ever even asked yourself, what is the thing that's causing me to be anxious? And, and whenever you figure out the answer to that, name it. Call it out. Expose it. Tell somebody else what it is. Louis Giglio wrote a book called Putting an X Through Anxiety. And he writes this. Once you feel like you can name it, you are on the road to freedom. Because when you can identify it, you can specifically cast it on Jesus. Jesus. You can transfer the weight and concern to his care, knowing he cares about you. So we call it out and we transfer it. We basically do what 1 Peter chapter 5 and verse 7 tells us to do, casting all our cares, our, all our anxieties on him. Why? Because he cares for you. That's what we're doing here. Where we're calling it out and we're transferring it. With, with, with the things that are causing the anxiousness in my life, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to identify it, I'm going to name it, I'm going to reveal it, I'm going to call it out, and then I'm going to get rid of it. I'm going to transfer it. 
I'm going to give it to God. I'm going to give it to the Lord. I'm going to do what Peter tells me to do. Now, don't miss this. Lies from the enemy don't have much power in the light. The lies of the enemy doesn't have much power when it's revealed, when it's brought out into the open. Paul says it this way in 2 Corinthians chapter 10 and verse 5. We destroy arguments and every lofty opinion raised against the knowledge of God and take every thought captive to obey Christ. So we're going to cast out the lies and we're going to start obeying the truth. Because all the thoughts that we have in our minds that are not from God need to go. They need to go. You need to reveal them. You need to call them out. You need to name them. And then you need to get rid of it. Because here's the reality. When you know whatever has popped into your mind is a lie, you don't take the time to be occupied by that thought. Why? Because it's a lie. And you know it's a lie because you know what's a lie and you know what's the truth. So if a lie pops into your head, it's got to go. Why? Because it's a lie. It doesn't need to be there. We get rid of it. Here's the second step. What is the truth that exposes something as a lie? What truth do you have to be reminded of that's going to expose whatever you're thinking about, whatever you're thinking about, whatever you're concerned about as being a lie? I mean, think about it. How could Paul not be overwhelmed and not be anxious when Paul is in the middle of a storm as a prisoner going to Rome to most likely be sentenced to death for his faith. So how in the world is Paul not freaking out on the boat right now? I think it's because he's living out what he wrote in Philippians chapter four and verse eight. I think it's because the thoughts that are in his head right now are not lies from the enemy, but the thoughts that are in his head right now are things that are true and things that are noble and things that are, and things that are lovely and things that are just and things that are pure. I believe he's thinking about those things. Paul learned to think on those things. He learned to think on what was true and to be able to spot what was a lie. He learned that. He was thinking on the truth about his God. Have you ever realized that two different people can get the same news and handle it completely differently? Why? One person's operating out of fear and the other person's operating out of faith. One person is believing the lies of whoever and one person is believing the truth of God and his word. What truth offsets the lie in our lives? And then here's number three. What is the promise that needs to be believed? Paul told us earlier this was something he learned three separate times. I learned, I learned, I learned. How did he learn? From experience. From experience. God had proved himself trustworthy over and over and over again in his life. Now, can, can I give you some homework to do? No? Okay, I'm going to give it to you anyway, all right? Here's what I want you to do. And don't worry, I'm not going to like send out a text message and I'm not going to like FaceTime you like this afternoon to make sure you're doing the homework or anything like that. But I would say this, that if you're going to do this, you're probably going to have a better chance doing it today as opposed to later in the week. So here's what I want you to do. I want you to make some lists. I want you to take a little bit of time and I want you to actually make two lists and, and, and write down one reminder. Two lists and one reminder. Here's the first list. Make a list of all of the things that God has brought you through. Make a list of all of the things that God has brought you through. Look back in your life and, and, and think about it. Give some thought to it. Pray about it. And, and ask God to reveal to you all of the different ways and times that he's brought you through. That he's done what he said he was going to do. And then also make a list of all that God has promised you. There's so many promises in his word to us as his children, as his followers, as Christians. So, so make a list of all of the promises that God makes to us. And then remember 
that God is going to be with you. That God's going with you. That you're not gonna be alone. You're not gonna be by yourself. Can you remember this morning that you're loved, you're valued, you're cherished, you're chosen, you're called, you're safe, you're protected. Can you remember that? Can you remember that God is with you and God's never gonna leave you and God's gonna provide you and and God's gonna empower you? Expose the lies that are currently in your mind. Cast them out and replace them with the truth of the word of God. Folks, we are long past due. Time to get to work, to get control of our minds back from the enemy. Would you pray with me? God, I thank you for today. And I thank you for the truth of your word. God, I pray that you would help us as we continue to move forward and think about and be reminded about the truth that is found in your word. And God, I pray that you would help us to call out those lies and transfer them to you. And fill our hearts and minds with the truth found in the word of God. God, I pray that chains will continue to fall off. And the shackles will be released from so many people who constantly battle for control of their mind. And God, I pray that that we could move full speed ahead. And we could set ourselves up to be used by you in in incredible ways because we're filling our minds with the truth of God's word and not the lies of the enemy. So God, would you please reveal to us what needs to be revealed. May we see it, may we hear it, may we feel it, and may we do something about it. May we learn what we need to learn so that we can do what we need to do. We ask all these things in your son's precious name. Amen. I want to encourage everyone to stand, if you would, please. And we're going to sing a song as we prepare to baptize a couple people today. And can I just encourage you, whatever you're fighting with, whatever you're battling against, whatever lie you're still trying to get rid of, can you just release it today? Just release it. Call it out, name it, identify it, and release it. And put your faith and trust in your God. So you come as we sing. I've been held in your
direct your attention over to the baptistry. Well, we are so excited about the step of obedience that these two individuals are taking in this service. And then we've got four that are going to be baptized in the 11 o'clock service. So we are excited about that. We rejoice with them. We celebrate with them. And then as always, we want to make sure that everybody understands and everybody's on the same page when I say that everyone that's going to be baptized today has already professed Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior. And what they're doing today is, is not only making that public, but just understanding that you know Jesus has called us to a life that's worth living and that we need to be willing to surrender and submit our lives every single day to the control of the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you've been here before for a baptismal service, you know what to do. You know what your part is. Your part when they come up out of the water is to celebrate, is to hoot and holler and yell and scream and clap and just let's celebrate with these individuals and the steps of obedience that they're taking today. Hi, my name is Keaton, but most everyone knows me as Kiki. I first found out about Jesus when Savannah, now my best friend, came into my life. Not only did she introduce me to Jesus, but she, along with her whole family, lived a life that made me want to know him. PC and Double F, you already know. <laughs> the Killinans have had a huge impact on my walk with Christ and are one of the reasons why I'm getting baptized today. The day Savannah brought me to youth group for the first time, I never expected this church to have such an impact on me in my life. It started with the occasional Wednesday night at youth group, but soon turned into Sunday mornings too. As I learned more about God, I wanted to grow my relationship and therefore began taking steps to do so. However, I felt very much as though I was just going through the motions. I wasn't truly growing in my faith. Instead, just simply checking things off a to-do list. Last year as a freshman in college, I found myself lacking in my faith almost 100% of the time. I felt very alone and continued to turn away from Jesus. However, he was there for all of it. At every point that I felt helpless and hopeless, Jesus was there. After struggling without him, I began turning towards him. Once I moved home from school, I decided to come to the Post, the young adults group. I started talking to so many amazing people and quickly felt at home. There I have met so many influential people who have helped me to grow in my relationship with Christ. Julie and Stephen were extremely welcoming and I immediately knew that they were truly genuine, amazing people who have an authentic love for Jesus as well as those around them. Julie has pointed me towards Jesus at every given opportunity, and I am so grateful for that. I have formed such amazing relationships within the Post and beyond thankful for those who have been and continue to be such an influence in my journey with Christ. Finally, I want to thank my parents for their continuous love and support. I have decided to get baptized because I have seen firsthand the power and grace of Jesus and have total faith in him. I have made the choice to rely on him in all things and live for him always. Kiki, because of your public profession of faith and obedience to the Lord's command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his death. My name is Shane Bowsman. I accepted the Lord as my Savior when I was seven years old. I was young but believed that Jesus died for my sins. I knew that I was loved by God, but I do not think that I really knew what it meant to live a Christian life. I am here today because I feel that it is time for me to really put into action the things that I have learned over the past seven years. I attended Liberty University, and my spiritual life changed tremendously. During that time, I saw my parents and my sister dive deeper into their faith in the Lord. I also met the love of my life at this time. Ricky has been there for me through some of the toughest moments of my life. She has helped mold me into the person I am today. Also, there is Craig and Stephanie. My in-laws have been a constant example for me on how I want to live a spiritual life. Being able to see how they serve the Lord while serving the church has been an eye-opening experience for me. I've been able to get a truer understanding of the word because of deep conversations we have had and the unwavering love they have shown me since entering the family. 
As I reflect on my past, I have had one constant struggle. The fear of disappointment is something that I have carried my entire life. I have always been concerned about the perception of others and trying to make everyone else happy. I've carried the weight of disappointing the people closest to me. I have created internal scenarios that have affected external relationships. Through all the fear and self-doubt that I have experienced, there has been one constant. God has shown his love and mercy time and time again. I am conquering my fear of disappointment daily. As the song Jaira says, I wasn't holding you up, so there's nothing I can do to let you down. These lyrics have, caught, or have taught me so much about myself and the wounds I have created because of self-doubt and fear. I want to live a better Christian life for myself and my family. I want to be the spiritual leader of my household. Today is the day that I get baptized with a full understanding of what all of that means to me and those around me. Not to make light of this subject, but Shane said, hey, are you going to cry? I said, probably not, but I may hold you underwater a little longer. <laughs> Shane, because of your public profession of faith and obedience to the Lord's command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. We're so excited about these individuals that are going to follow the Lord in believer's baptism today. And um, you guys know how we, how we do things around here at Bridgepoint Church, especially on Baptism Sunday, that we want to celebrate with them. We want to rejoice with them. And so when they get baptized and they come up out of that water, they need to hear you guys just hooting and hollering and celebrating the decision that they're making today. So as always, we, we also always want to make sure that we're on the same page in regards to the fact that these three individuals that are going to be baptized today, that they have already placed their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is their way of being obedient and taking that next step of uh, complete surrender to the Lord and just going all in in their relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. So we're, we're excited about these um, opportunities for baptism today. And uh, Maddie's going to go ahead and be first. This is Maddie Henniger. Before I started going to church, I let anxiety control my thoughts and feelings. Now I believe that Jesus is my Lord and Savior. He died for me so I could have the opportunity to live. I believe that the struggles I experience in life has led me to be a stronger person today. I am stronger knowing that God is by my side. I have learned to be more forgiving of myself and others and praise God for all the wonderful opportunities he has given me. A verse that encourages me is Isaiah 41.10. So do not fear, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Maddie, because of your public profession of faith and obedience to the Lord's command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. <laughs> My name is Luke Henniger. I became interested in learning more about Jesus after a good friend of mine gave me a Bible and told me that my name was in it. Attending church services has made me realize that I want to follow Jesus and live my life for him. I believe Jesus Christ is my Savior who died for my sins so that I could live. He saves me even though I don't deserve it. A Bible verse that motivates me is Ephesians 2, 8 through 9. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith, and this is not from yourselves, it is the gift of God not by works, so that no one can boast. Luke, because of your public profession of faith and obedience to the Lord's command, I baptize you, my brother, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection. This is Alexis Pickerel. Growing up, I was raised in a Christian household and accepted Jesus into my heart at an early age. However, through my teen and early adult years, I began to stray from the Lord, and he no longer played an active role in my life. 
I fell into sin and felt an emptiness in my life. I tried to fill this emptiness with partying and trying to keep up a certain social status. These things repeatedly led me to remain feeling empty and unhappy with myself. It took me a while to figure out that the reason I was left constantly feeling like this was because I was not living the life that aligned with what God wanted. I finally realized I needed to turn towards God to better my life. I am blessed to be following Jesus as he saved me from myself. I want to continue living my life through God and furthering my relationship with Jesus. Alexis, because of your public profession of faith and obedience to the Lord's command, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Buried in the likeness of his death. Raised in the likeness of his death.